Good evening on behalf of UK Romania Group and welcome to the third of our Romanian Heritage Season events. These were brought to you in partnership with the Romanian Cultural Institute, London. Our first event, Neglect, looked at the broad challenge of built heritage conservation and preservation in Romania. Our second, Exploitation, was a study of threats to Romania's wild places and efforts to preserve and promote its wilderness. Both are now available on our YouTube channel. We close the season tonight with erasure, a reflection on Romania's vanishing Jewish heritage and the importance of valuing and celebrating it both as culture in itself and as legacy of Jewish experience in Romania. We will be taking questions tonight from those watching, so post those underneath the Facebook video streams. We'll try to pick those up from there and address some of those as we go along. On a personal note, I'd like to dedicate the event tonight to Sander Miller, who passed away at the end of January. Sihana Levraha. But let me hand over now to Michael Mayle, Chief Executive and Founder of the Foundation for Jewish Heritage, who will introduce the panelists and moderate the event. Right. Hello. Uh, good, ev good evening, everyone, if I can say that, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, can, can everyone see and hear me okay? Does this look okay, David? Yeah, okay. So, First of all, you may detect that that was uh, one Scottish accented person and is now handing over to another Scottish person, but this is a programme about Romania. Don't be alarmed. We're going to open this event with an overview of the history of the Jewish community in Romania, focusing particularly on the 20th century experience. And this will be given by Dr. Raul Karsto eh, Karstocha, who is an honorary fellow in modern European history at the Stanley Burton Center at the University of Leicester. The center is the oldest Holocaust research center in the UK. Raoul's work focuses on the history of Central and Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries with an emphasis on anti-Semitism, fascism and the Holocaust. His book, Peasants into Fascists, Anti-Semitism and Fascism in the ideology of the legionary movement in interwar Romania is forthcoming from Routledge. We will then be joined after his presentation by two special guests. We have with us Penina Zilberman, who is the founder and CEO of the Tarboot Foundation Siget. Here is Penina. And Gilbert Shaim, who is the custodian of the very beautiful Coral Temple Synagogue in Bucharest. So after Raul's presentation, our guests will be invited to comment and to talk a little bit more about their own work. And we will then have a general discussion. And as David mentioned, we'd be, we would then welcome questions from our, our audience. So let me begin and now hand over to Raul. Thank you very much. Michael, for that generous introduction. Thank you, David, for um, inviting me to talk at this event and thank you for organizing this event. Um, I am going to share my screen now because what I want to show you is um, a few maps that might be relevant to follow as I'm, I proceed with my presentation. Can I just get a confirmation that you are seeing the, the, the slides now? That's great, thank you very much. So yeah. I'm going to try in a way the impossible to cover the history of Jewish communities in Romania um, in the 19th and, er, and 20th century with a special focus on their erasure or on the, on, the Jewish, on, the, on the experience of Jewish loss during this time. As a brief introductory note antedating the 19th century, I'll just say that Jews were present on the territory of what were to become the Romanian principalities ever since the second century AD, the time of the Roman conquest. And we have inscriptions on tombstones that attest their presence at this time. A second wave of migration occurred then following the expulsions from Spain in the late 15th century. However, although the presence of Jews is mentioned in the medieval records of the land, the size of the community before the 19th century was quite small with less than 10,000 Jews, almost all of them Sephardim in, in Wallachia and a slightly higher number about 12,000, mostly Ashkenazi in Moldova. 
Um, and that's why I'm talking about the 19th century, because that changes radically in 1829 with the Treaty of Adrianople, which allows the Romanian principalities some degree of independence from the Ottoman Empire in terms of foreign trade, connecting them to the, to the European economy and creating commercial opportunities. And this comes at a time when Jews are being persecuted in the Russian Empire, in the Tsarist Empire. And this combination leads to a phenomenon of mass migration. So by 1859, the number of Jews reaches approximately 135,000 in the two principalities. So just in a matter of 30 years, the numbers goes from about 20,000 to 135,000. And they are overwhelmingly concentrated in the principality of Moldova, where they make up about 10% of the population. Whereas in Wallachia, they only make up around one or 2% of the population. Combined, after the, the principalities are united uh, in 1859, they make up around 4.5% of the total population of the United Principalities of what later would become the modern Romanian state. And the story of their erasure of the, or of their persecution begins with the 1834 organic regulations that is known in English, the first sort of like proto-constitutional uh, legal arrangement that modern Romania has. And in that Jews are legally defined as foreigners. And this definition would become a most consequential one later on. There is a, a, a change in pace if you want with 1848 with the revolutionaries in both Wallachia and Moldova being in favor of the emancipation of the Jews and talking about the Israelite brothers and their, their unity in terms of, of, of fighting for, um, for, um, uh, for the revolution of, of 1848. But the same 1848 as the generation of 1848 would later become the state makers of the late 19th century and, and we would become responsible for the um, discrimination and then persecution of Jews later on. Another important moment is that of 1866, when Romania gets its first constitution and article seven of the, of, of the constitution picks up on this notion of Jews as, as foreigners and specifies, I quote, only foreigners of Christian rights can become Romanian. So Jews are barred from citizenship with article seven of the constitution of 1866. Um, this remains in place until the 1878 Congress of Berlin. Following the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, 1878, Romania seeks to acquire its independence at the Congress of Berlin. Um, and the great powers are putting pressure on Romania to emancipate the Jews in exchange for recognition of its independence. And therefore, on, on behalf of Romanian state makers, Romanian elites at this time, there's outrage over what they perceive as foreign interference in internal matters. They see it as an affront to Romania's sovereignty. And they resolve this, this issue by, through a subterfuge, they allow for naturalization of Jews because they were, they were foreigners. They were supposed to become Romanians before they could get civil and political rights. But they only allow this naturalization to occur individually and under very restrictive conditions. In the last phase of the application, two thirds of the parliament had to vote in favor of one person to acquire, one, one Jewish person to acquire Romanian citizenship. So as you can imagine, only very few qualify and only very few uh, Jews become naturalized in the period before the First World War. This period be between 1878 and 1914 also witnesses the crystallization of Romanian antisemitism. There's, there's massive discrimination with over 200 decrees and laws with an antisemitic character passed during this period. Uh, gradually excluding Jews from various professions. And this is combined with the expulsion of Jewish intellectuals who are critical of the Romanian uh, state. There is thus widespread antisemitism as at the level of the um, elites, making Romania next to the Tsarist Empire, uh, as Hannah Arendt called it, the most antisemitic country in pre-war Europe. Now, during the war, despite their exclusion from Romanian society, there is massive participation of, um, of Jews in the First World War, far more, far above their proportion of the general population. Um, the first emancipation actually comes, perhaps ironically, under German occupation in 1918. But this is then subsequently invalidated by the king, um, as all the legislation passed by the government that collaborated with the German occupiers is. And therefore, the moment of um, the emancipation of the Jewish community in Romania, their acquiring of civil and political rights, that's what I mean by emancipation, only comes at the end of the First World War, the Paris Peace Conference, where even then, uh, Romanian elites are very much reluctant to do this. Two prime ministers choose to resign as prime ministers rather than sign the minority treaties that would make the Jewish community equal to Romanians in, in, in legal and political terms. Um, eventually, a third one ratifies the minority treaty, and this is then implemented in the 1923 constitution, 
which is the first moment in Romanian modern history that Jews acquire equal rights. And this makes Romania the very last country in Europe to emancipate the Jews. Now, one note about the Jews in Greater Romania. First of all, they're no longer, and I would, uh, I should maybe move on to the map of Greater Romania. Of course, you see that the territorial acquisitions after the First World War, but maybe this map is more relevant because this map shows you the ethnic composition of Greater Romania. And if you think of the previous map of the, of the two principalities of Moldova and Wallachia, what you can clearly notice is that you can see their shape here because this shape shows you the ethnic makeup. And it's in the two principalities of Moldova and Wallachia that you have the highest concentration of Romanians. The newly acquired territories are much more ethnically heterogeneous than the ones um, making up the so-called Old Kingdom of Romania pre-First World War. Um, the Jewish community is in yellow, so you can see larger uh, concentrations in the Northeast um, and also in the Northwest. You can also see, of course, the Jewish community of Bucharest. That's, that's quite visible in the, in the capital. But this ethnic composition will become highly consequential when we look at um, the story of the Holocaust in Romania. Now, one thing to be said about Jews in interwar Romania is that they're no longer the largest minority as they used to be in pre-First World War Romania, but they are the second after the Hungarians um, with 4.2% of the population in the interwar period, Jews are the second largest ethnic minority. And in the 1930 census, considered generally to be the most reliable one for the interwar period, there's a number of 756,930 persons who declare Jewish um, ethnicity. The number of Romanians drops from 92% to 72% to in interwar Romania, which again tells you why the situation of um, ethnic minorities in interwar Romania becomes much more of a crisis one for the Romanian state. It used to be remarkably homogeneous for the, uh, for the area of Central and Eastern Europe, where you know, as a rule, an ethnic mix is, is, the, is, the, is the rule rather than the exception, right? Romania was an exception in this regards before the First World War. It's no longer so during the interwar period. By getting back to the Jewish communities, we're not talking about one Jewish community, we're talking at least as a minimum about five different Jewish communities. There's on the one hand, a small, a long-standing and small community in Wallachia that, as I mentioned, dates back all the way to the Spanish expulsion of 1492. It's mostly concentrated in, in Bucharest and to a significant extent, it's more assimilated to the Romanian um, uh, majority in the communities elsewhere. There's then this more recent larger Ashkenazi community in Moldova resulting from mass migration after 1829 that I've already mentioned. But then there are three more Jewish communities added to Romania with the new territories. There are the Jews of Transylvania who are emancipated since 1867. They are mostly assimilated to Hungarian culture because that was the dominant culture in that part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they are very patriotic. They are, as they some of them call themselves, Magyars of the Jewish faith. As a result, since Hungary is perceived to be a, a problematic neighbor by interwar Romania, they are seen by the Romanian state as potentially disloyal, as being loyal to Hungary and its revisionist claims on Transylvania rather than to the Romanian state. Then there are the Jews in Bessarabia who had long been exposed to discrimination and violence in the Romanov Empire. So they have very little identification with the, with the Tsarist Empire, unlike the ones in Transylvania. Um, and therefore in Bessarabia you have both Zionism and socialism very prominent. What you don't have is loyalty to, to the Russian Empire. And then you have the Jews in Bukovina, who are a large group, the largest, if you, if you look at proportions of the population in the provinces, the ones in Bukovina make up the largest group. They are 12.86% of the population um, before the, the, the First World War. They're again emancipated, uh, but they're assimilated to German culture because Bukovina had been part of the Austrian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So you have distinct communities and the only ones who just see Jews are the anti-Semites or the ones who don't really care to too much to understand the Jewish communities in Romania. So what happens in Romania? I, I was talking about how anti-Semitism was prominent in, in 19th century Romania, but it was very much at the, at the elite level. People talk in parliament about this. There are legal, there's legal discrimination of Jews, which is of course horrible, but there's little violence if you compare it, for example, with the Russian empire. This changes in the interwar period. There's increasing street violence, growing anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism becomes also increasingly mainstream. Romania's interwar fascist movement the Legion of the Archangel Michael, um, on which, as, as Michael said, uh, my, my forthcoming book will, will deal with their anti-Semitism, is largely responsible for radicalizing anti-Semitism in interwar Romania and making it mainstream. Um, 
1938, the calls for, anti for the reintroduction of anti-Semitic legislation are met, and there is anti-Semitic legislation um, implemented in, in 1938, excluding some of the, of the Jews in, um, uh, in Greater Romania from citizenship once again. With this, we, can, we come to the Second World War and to the paradox of the Holocaust in Romania. Why a paradox? Because on the one hand, no country besides Nazi Germany was involved in massacres of Jews on such a scale as uh, Romania was. On the other hand, Romania also has the highest survival rate in Eastern Europe. Approximately 60% of the Jewish community um, survives, uh, survives the Holocaust, which is the highest rate except Bulgaria, which refused to deport its, its, uh, its Jews despite being an ally of Nazi Germany. So why, how does this happen? And the explanation for this goes back to um, these maps that I was showing you. So you, here you have a map of wartime Romania. And as you can see, once again, the borders change. There's a territorial loss. Northern Transylvania is lost uh, in 1940. Um, Bukovina and Bessarabia are lost, but then recovered after the Romanian uh, attack on the Soviet Union. But Romania also acquires this region, Transnistria. It's marked um, in, 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 in gray on the map. And it's a region that had never been part of the Romanian state and that's basically gifted by the Nazis to its Romanian ally. Now, this is um, where most of the incidents of violence and most of the bulk of the Holocaust in Romania takes place. If you look at this map, these maps are, by the way, from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They're, they're available open access if you want to consult them. And it shows, this map shows the Romanian participation in massacres between 1941 and 1942. And you strikingly see how they are concentrated in this area, the Northeast. On the one hand, having a larger Jewish population, as, as I've already shown. On the other hand, um, making up these territories that had been lost by the Romanian state in 1940, then reacquired in 1941. Um, this is where the, the deportations um, and the mass murder happens. Hardly anything happens to the Jews in, uh, well, it's not anything. There is economic spoliation, um, you know, Jewish property is confiscated and used to, to finance the Romanian war effort, but there are hardly any deportations of Jews in the old kingdom of Romania and southern Transylvania. So this is the striking discrepancy between the two communities, the one very much affected by uh, the Holocaust in Romania and the one that's that remains almost the same in terms of numbers as the pre-war numbers after the war. So if you uh, once again, if we if we zoom in the northeast, you once again see, this is a map showing the deportations, and they show you that the deportations, with very few exceptions, um, individual deportations of people who are considered to be a danger to the Romanian state, uh, happen from the northeast and from the provinces of, of Bessarabia and Bukovina, those provinces that had changed hands in, in 1940 and then. Um, back again in 1941. However, the, the thing to be pointed out here is that those deportations and generally the Holocaust in Romania, the responsibility for it lies mostly or exclusively almost with the Romanian authorities. The picture you see here is of a deportation from the village of Briceva in Bessarabia. And what you can see in the pictures are Romanian army officers, Romanian soldiers, Romanian population carrying guns. The, 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 the men in the white shirt is the local um, uh, school principal um, um, who was a rabbi and I see might and who participates in the deportations. You of course see the see the rabbi here on the left of the picture and you see the Jewish community being, being rounded up for deportation. What you don't see in this picture are Germans. There's no German soldier, there's no SS in this picture and there were many of the Romanian Jews who were deported to Transnistria never actually got to see Germans. This is very much a deportation carried out by the Romanians. So then if we are to ask how was the survival rate so high, that has to do with the change of policy taking place in 1942. So while deportations start on the 9th of October 1941, which is today Holocaust Memorial Day in Romania, they are terminated in the autumn of 1942 and the policy of repatriation is put in place, even emigration to Palestine being allowed in exchange for payments, payments that vary between 350 and 900 US dollars. We will see that it, it, it's a policy that then the socialist regime also picks up. So why did Antonescu change his mind? Antonescu ordered the deportations and then, and then sort of like uh, reversed his decision. Several things to keep into account. Opportunism, uh, it's unlikely, it was increasingly unlikely for Germany to win the war. And he, he thinks there will be future reprisals against uh, Germany's allies. Um, there's mounting pressures within Romania and abroad against the deportations. It's a, it's a wrong thing to think all Romanians were anti-Semites. They, they weren't. There were Romanians who campaigned to stop the deportations. There were Romanians who opposed the deportations. Um, and you can find them at all levels from the, you know, the queen mother, um, Helen, to leaders of the democratic parties, to Romanian intellectuals, 
representatives of the churches, uh, whether they be the Catholic or the, or the Orthodox Church, um, Romanian diplomats, and so on, who oppose uh, the deportations and keep petitioning Antonescu to stop them and to, to, to return the Jews to, to Romania. Finally, and importantly, there's a Nazi demand, which eventually becomes an ultimatum, to deport the Romanian Jews to Nazi uh, extermination camps. And this is seen as an affront to Romanian sovereignty. If you remember 1878, it reminds, it, it is reminiscent of that. Situation of Jews in Romania should be a, an internal affair. Nazi pressures are only making things um, uh, worse for the Nazis and you know, better for, for, the, for the Jews in Romania because they are seen as, 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 as un, uh, unreasonable demands on, on, on the sovereign Romanian state. And this is what explains the change in policy. And this is how um, uh, half the population of the Jews um, survives the Holocaust. And here you see pictures of orphans from Transnistria who were repatriated um, and then left for, for Israel. The last picture shows them um, settled in, in Israel after the war. Um, the, the person who was responsible for this is Annie Anderman. She, she shows in the picture with the children. Um, so after the Second World War, um, the surviving Jews in Romania are about 428,000, which makes them the largest group in the socialist bloc except for the Soviet Union. Now, what happens afterwards? Initially, emigration is allowed until 1948, but then as Romania aligns itself with Soviet policy and denounces um, the, the, the state of Israel after the state of Israel aligns itself with the Western part of the, of the, of the Western bloc in the Cold War, um, emigration is then blocked until 1950. It's then reopened in 1950 to 1952, and the large number of Jews, about 110,000, leave the country between these years, from 1950 to 1952. This period ends with the purge of Anna Pauker, who was a prominent leader in the Socialist Party and Socialist regime in Romania, and she had always campaigned for allowing migration to, to, to Israel. Already during this period, Romania receives both currency and oil drilling equipment from Israel in exchange for issuing exit visas to Romanian Jews. So this trades that later on becomes an actual trade with the state of Israel begins during this period. There is then a ban on migration until 1958. And during this time, there's also persecution of Zionists. The trade is then resumed by, by Gheorghe Gheorghe Udej, the leader of, of socialist Romania at the time, um, as an actual trade. So they, they, he's agreeing to issue exit visas in exchange for foreign currency. And between 1958 and 1965, when Ceausescu comes to power, Nicolae Ceausescu, uh, some 110,000 Jews leave the country again for payments varying between $4,000 and $6,000 per person. Um, Ceausescu initially displays outrage at this situation when he discovers it, but soon after resumes the trade, actually increasing the price. So under Ceausescu, the price varied between $2,000 and $50,000 per person going up to 250,000 for individuals who are considered to be of exceptional values to the state. Some of them were not even allowed to migrate for whatever sum. Um, then West Germany discovers the trade with Israel and starts doing the same with the German minority in Romania in the 1970s, i.e. pays the Romanian state to allow Germans to migrate to West Germany. So in the mid 1970s, Ceausescu actually states in a meeting, I quote, oil, Jews and Germans are our best export commodity. So you can see how for the state, Jews are not fellow citizens, at, at, even at this time when the state is openly anti-anti-Semitic, but they are a commodity to be traded. Anti-Semitism then becomes more strident in the 1980s, and it becomes ever more strident after the collapse of socialism. So in the 1990s, uh, Antonescu, who had been arrested, tried and executed after the, uh, August 1944, is a, a cult of him is being revived, starting with the late 80s, but um, ever more so in the 1990s. There's also a revival of the legionary movement seen as martyrs of communism at this time against the backdrop of, of, um, of anti-communism. And despite the fact that the Romanian state has acknowledged responsibility for the Holocaust, largely once again, as in the 19th century, as a result of foreign pressures, i.e. part of its campaign to join the EU and NATO, there is continuing anti-Semitism within Romanian society, despite the fact that the number of Jews is extremely small. So if the Jews in Romania were 428,000 at the end of the Second World War. The last census recorded um, little over um, 3,000 uh, persons who declared Jewish ethnicity or belonged to the Mosaic faith. Now, the communities themselves estimate the number to be much higher, to be between 5,000 and 9,000. But still, this is a tiny number in a country that once used to have 750,000 Jews. And this is what I would like to, to emphasize in terms of the erasure of Jewish communities in Romania. It's not just a matter of the Holocaust itself. 
but a long history in which Jews were seen as foreigners, as a group distinct from and in opposition to Romanian society, constantly suffered discrimination and persecution of various types and intensities. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Well, can I say it, Raul? I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not too sure if you drew breath through that. That was a master class. That was masterful, Raul. You took, you covered so much territory there. And uh, I've learned a huge amount just in the past 15 minutes of your presentation. So now what I plan to do is, what I'd like to do is bring in our two other guests. Um, and what I'd like, I'd like them to do, starting with you, Panina, if that's okay, is if you can just say a little bit more about who, who you are and the, the SIGET program of which you are the founder and then uh, give a response if there's particular ways that you'd like to respond to what Raul presented to us just now so I'll, I'll hand over the floor to you. Thank you uh, I would like to thank David and Michael for inviting me to join this special panel and uh, thank you very much Raul you really rushed <laughs> you didn't breathe you should <laughs> water. Um, I first of all want to put uh, some general statements. I was not born in Romania. However, both of my parents were. My mother was born in Siget in 1926 and my father was born in Bucharest in 1926. They met on the boat coming to Israel. My passion for Romania started with my grandparents on my father's side, the ones from Bucharest, as their last station, although they came, uh, grandpa came from Moldova area and grandma came close to Bucharest. Um, they have not had any, um, shall I say, hatred for the country, on the contrary. Uh, they instilled a great amount of culture and uh, love for the country as Jews. They were assimilated Jews, uh, very highly prominent, and uh, maybe that's the reason uh, that they were not really affected, not even by the pogrom on uh, January uh, 21st, 1941, that took place in Bucharest. Um, and they taught me the Romanian language. My mother talked about Siget in the house, and I, as a child, imagined a very picturesque, little village, not city, village. I arrived to Bucharest on the first time on May 1998, 10 years after the revolution. So Romania is not yet so advanced, but uh, you can see, I could see some changes. I, by the way, followed always with friends what's happening in Romania. My parents nor my grandparents did ever go back uh, to visit Romania. So I arrived in May, 1998, and I stayed two days in Bucharest and I want to go to Siget. I arrived, I loved it. I also found the first cousin to my mother Survivors, by the way, that's a phenomenon of survivors, do have family secrets. So this woman, first cousin to my mother, was a family secret. She hasn't done anything wrong, but that's how the stories are. Moving right along, I started to come to Romania very often and always go to see it, spend time with uh, Goldie, our cousin, from her, I heard everything about our family. And uh, in 2013, in the summer of 2013, while I'm there, I decided I'm going to speak to the mayor and ask if it's possible to have a march from the house of the late Professor Elie Wiesel to the train station. 
On the following year, because in 2014, we were, we were about to commemorate 70 years to the deportations. The deportations in the Mara Moorish region took place May 16 to 22nd, 1944, extremely late uh, in the Holocaust uh, historical timeline. Um, and the deportations took the Jews to Auschwitz. My mother is considered, a, was considered on Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen survivor. Uh, the mayor was not uh, there, it was summertime. However, I must give that mayor a lot of credit. He did contact me, he agreed. And from a little March, it became a gathering or a conference over a long weekend from a Thursday till Tuesday morning. Within four months, I was able to gather 150 participants from all over the world. It was an amazing event. Following that, I kind of said, so what's next? And the next was the creation and the establishment of the foundation. And the full name of the foundation in Romanian is Fundatia Tarbut Siget, Cultura și Educația în Judaica, meaning, first of all, the word tarbut means culture. So one of uh, the most important missions of our foundation is to transmit the culture that was in the Mara Moorish region before the deportations. The Mara Moorish region was a highly dense Jewish community of Hasidim. They also had Zionists as well, but there was no such thing an assimilated Jew there. There was, you either were very orthodox religious with black hats, what we call, and there's also a big dynasty of the Teitelbaum or the Satmar that come from our region. So it's a very famous and common region. If you go to Israel and you speak to somebody about the Satmar, right away they know what you're talking about. Um, so we emphasize the culture and the education as well. This is what Tarbu does for high schools. We started small only in uh, Siget itself and by Amare, which is a distance of an hour. Um, and now, before the COVID-19, we were actually all over the country. And our programs include uh, and doesn't limit to films, to writing contests, to uh, a, a art contests, we bring in singers, authors, we translate books from English and Hebrew into Romanian. And the reason is because the memoirs that we offer are um, not censored, what we say. There were survivors in Romania that wrote memoirs or novels about what happened to them during the Holocaust. But unfortunately, as you well know, they were censored by the communist regime. So the books that we are translating were not censored, of course. Um, so this is what we do for the locals. Now for the Jewish people, Beside the gatherings, and we've had already four gatherings, and we've attracted close to a thousand people over the years, um, is uh, genealogical services that lead into family roots journeys. That's another um, important service that we offer because second generation, third, and even the fourth generation are interested to go back to the towns, not necessarily that they find 
um, many of the things or the houses of the uh, grandparents or other family members, but they um, do, I can't say enjoy, but they feel the synergy. They feel um, what was there. And of course, visiting the cemetery, visiting the synagogue, and so on. We offer this to the region of Maramurish and Bukovina. As Raul mentioned in the historical uh, overview, those from Bukovina that were deported to the Transnistria, Transnistria region. I think I would like to stop here, Michael. Well, that's, I think that, um, that's a very good, Penina, that's a very good overview. And what thank I'll do, you. Yeah, and we'll come back to you. Gilbert, do you want to just say a little bit about, about your role in the, in the Coral Synagogue in Bucharest? Good evening, and uh, thanks uh, to the organizers. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to join this wonderful meeting. My name is Gilbert Scheim, and I'm the Gabbai, or the custodian of the Coral Temple of Bucharest, which is the crown jewel of the synagogues of Romania, let's say, have been uh, very much part and um, uh, parcel of, of the community ever since the beginning of the 10th, 20th uh, century, like a beacon for the entire uh, Romanian Jewish um, uh, community. Uh, it was um, in built. Um, to uh, represent the epi in the in the mid nineteenth century, to represent the epitome, it was to represent the epitome of Romanian Jewish emancipation. Uh, unfortunately, it was um, uh, first uh, set ablaze by Romanian nationalists just before the inauguration, eighteen sixty six, and restored by uh, eighteen sixty seven uh, with the help of the king at the time and and also the church, the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, then it um, um, went on to be expanded uh, in 1891, a, um, a further um, um, <clears throat> story was added, a further uh, um, gallery was, was added. Then in the 1930s, there, there was a, a modern wing uh, built um, comprising of a small uh, daily services synagogue and, uh, and, um, and a conference hall. Um, it suffered uh, through its history from earthquakes that badly damaged it, fascist attacks, uh, the passing of time, neglect, restorations after earthquakes, after the passing of time. Uh, in the early 2000s, it ended up in a very bad shape. Uh, it was restored. Uh, thanks uh, to funding from the government of Romania, also from Ju uh, Joint Distribution Committee for the United States, the Caritas of many, uh, Foundation, and many, many, many other um, and other donors. Uh, luckily, um, um, in 2014, 2015, we we started a visiting program. Uh, up till now, I think we welcome over 100,000 visitors from throughout the world. Many of them not Jewish, <laughs> uh, many of them for the first time in a Jewish place of worship, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, we're looking um, hopeful for a very bright future, maybe after the pandemic ends. <laughs> so for now, we just stopped the visiting program due to this uh, terrible uh, plague. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Thank you. Well no, thank you for that, Gilbert. That's great. And of course, we have that magnificent picture behind you. Um, <laughs> of you. the synagogue itself. So can I can I ask you, I mean, can I ask you both Panina and Gilbert? I mean, you know, this term erasure, that is the 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 head, the the, the subject, that this how this event has been described. I'm kind of curious to to get uh, to, to get your response to that that title, whether you feel that is fair, that is how we should be talking about the Jews of Romania today. I mean, is erasure a fair description? And if I could ask you to, to link that to the question of where are, we up, where are we up to with Jewish heritage preservation today across Romania? So we know we have this phenomenon of orphaned heritage, so many synagogues that lost their communities of users, some magnificent buildings across the country. So if you can talk about the question of erasure, and, and lead into the question of preservation of this heritage and where, where are we up to? Gilbert, do you want to go first? 
Yes. We were once a huge community, almost 800, over 800,000 strong. Now we're a few thousand, more or less, all over the country. But, but still, we were very lucky to preserve uh, some of the most beautiful synagogues across Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, thanks to the fact that we had dropped later by Rosen, which I, my, my, my parents were married by Rabbi Rosen in the temple in 1971. I grew up listening to his sermons. I, I, I ended up listening, uh, ended up uh, knowing his sermons by heart. This man, which is larger than life, although um, he uh, was part of the establishment, he also fought the regime and he he put himself against the regime and against the will of the regime, which saw we saw to 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 erase Jewish education in a communist country. He succeeded to maintain this Jewish education and the result of this Jewish education. We had Hebrew lessons during communism, Judaism lessons, Jewish weddings, and worshiping in Jewish worshiping places all over the country, which was unbelievable at the time. Mm -hmm. Even during the most, the darkest communist repression. Uh, so the, um, this situation allowed us to, um, uh, let's say, go through communism with uh, many of our uh, places of heritage going. After communism collapsed, we uh, inherited those places. Of course, we did our best to uh, maintain the places going and get the funding to restore when that was possible, uh, pleading with the Jewish organizations, with the national organization, with the government of the country, which helped us a lot lately. It was not easy. There were many trials and tribulations, but in, uh, in, in the end, we succeeded. Uh, and now about the future, how I see things, for example, as num the numbers of Jews may, 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 may be dwindling, not only Romania, but all over the world. There's no other chance but to cooperate with the larger community. This is our history. This is Jewish history, but this is not only Jewish history. This is also Romanian history, European history, and universal history. And only in conjunction with the global community, with the local communities, will succeed to maintain these places after we may disappear, right? Okay. So okay. Thank you. many people just tell me, okay, I had many, many visitors just, just told me, okay, forget it. It's just a building. It's just a building. Or it's just religion. It's not just a building. It's not just religion. It's what kept Jews going as Jews, keeping their identity for millennia in synagogues throughout the world. They kept saying, so next year in Jerusalem. This happened in Baghdad, it happened in Morocco, it happened in New York, it happened in Bucharest. Without these places of worship called synagogues, what the Greeks would call, they're not just places of worship. In fact, they're places of gathering, Beit Knesset, house of gathering in Hebrew. The Greeks would call it a forum, an agora. Without these places, without these agoras, our identity would not have been kept up to this day and hopefully in the future. Okay. Thank you. And it's a symbol It's a symbol of continuing relevance and continuing presence. So, Penina, what would you say in terms of this question of erasure and where are we up to in Romania in terms of trying to preserve the Jewish story and the Jewish heritage in the country? So, so I would say, uh, Gilbert, I'm just asking Penina. Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> so, um, as I said, I arrived in Romania 10 years after the revolution. So I don't really have personal experiences like Gilbert did. Uh, I hear stories, I read, and I look from the year I came on. So, Number one, I see a revival of Jewish heritage in general. And what does that mean in general? Now I'm going to go a little bit uh, in more in details. Number one, if we look at the number of synagogues that have been restored, I would say 10 to 15 years, in the last 10 to 15 years. And even now as we speak, there are two that are being 
under uh, restoration. That's number one. So doesn't matter if we have people to come and pray there, but the building represents our history, the architecture, the basically a synagogue turns into a museum in most cases. Some localities, some small towns or cities have undertaken the restored synagogue and turned it into a concert hall. So there is still a use for it. And I mean, I'm not even mentioning the topic of tourism because it's obvious that every restored synagogue or any other location throughout Romania is part of the Romanian tourism. As a matter of fact, the Minister of uh, Tourism sends in regular years a big delegation to Israel for the annual Mediterranean Tourist Fair. And that's where we are promoting a lot about the Jewish tours. So this, I see, again, a revival. This is as far as buildings. Now, as far as interaction with the Jews that, and I don't want to get now into who's a Jew, if it's by mother, by father, etc. cetera. Yeah. Jews by me, I count the Jews either by mother or father, because we are not really here into any issue yeah. of religion three times a year, again, JDC uh, started to offer a weekend conference that's called Bereshit, and it takes place in various cities. So what happens is that as many as possible that can join are coming to a specific community that maybe there are only 20 or 30 Jews. And you have a full weekend of prayers, of dancing, singing, Jewish food, everything. And this happens three times per year, just before important. What, what's holidays. its purpose? What's its purpose? The purpose is to refresh Judaism courses on Judaism topics. The lecturers, the instructors, come usually from Israel, from the University of Tel Aviv, from University of Ariel, various places. So it's trying to, trying to maintain and develop Jewish life. Exactly, yeah. okay? Now, the major cities, Bucharest, Oradia, Timisoara, have like their own JCC, where they lead their own Friday night meals. Uh, yeah. I should just say, Penina, just uh, the JCC means Jewish Community Center, by the way. Just sure, to... thank you. <laughs> see, that's in North America. Uh, so this is what I see. Now, there is uh, once a year a gathering only for women. Last one was two years ago in Timisoara. That was amazing. There were like 150 women from around Romania. And I must say that the communities subsidize and help the people to make sure that they can make it to come because it's traveling and the hotel and so on. So I personally see constant growth. And there's another very, very important aspect. We talked about the Jews, either by mother or father. But there is another group that it's called sympathizers. What does that mean? That means supposedly they are non-Jews who feel something in their heart that they want to get closer to the traditions, to our holidays, and there are many of them. So I'm not saying that we're going on a conversion issue here. Yeah. No, I don't want to touch. That's a very sensitive yeah. issue. But we're talking about heritage. We're talking about culture. Yes. So if there are non-Jews that are interested in our culture, welcome and come. 
Okay. So I, I would describe your, your description, Pineda, as more upbeat. So you'd say, despite the fact maybe, you know, quality rather than quantity, that there's a lot going on, even although the community is small. And that's where I also pick up from Gilbert. That Correct. I, that there's a sense that there's, there remains a sense of optimism, despite the small numbers. And we also know that, I, I don't know whether some Israelis have moved to Romania, right? Yeah. But in the, uh, mainly in Bucharest and it's big. And uh, so very few of them really get involved because the type of is uh, the Israeli type of uh, individual, it's either you are orthodox or you are nothing, meaning you are uh, completely assimilated. Thank you, Leisha, that's right. There is one point which I think is extremely important, and that is that many of the Jewish heritage sites are not managed by Jews. Yeah. For example, if we take in Seaget, the Elie Wiesel Museum yes. is managed by a lovely young woman. She has her credentials in Judaism. She speaks Hebrew. She speaks a little bit of Yiddish. She's not Jewish officially, but she's doing a marvelous job. And that goes across Europe, actually. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was thinking that, Penina, as we know, that is not unusual. Exactly. But why am I mentioning it, uh, Michael, here? Because it's, a, it's the phenomena that is going to keep it. My kids don't speak Romanian. I did bring my kids to Siget. They attended the gathering. But to say that they will c continue my uh, beginning or the, the foundation, I doubt it. And that, Panina, ties in with what Gilbert was saying about this being shared heritage. Exactly. It's Jewish heritage. It's the, it's the heritage of Siget. And it's the mm -hmm. heritage of Romania. So, that, you know, that it's, it's, it's of shared interest. And also, Gilbert, I picked up your comment that you were saying there has been public funding, some government funding that's been coming in. Right? It was the, the Romanian government. So let me, Raul, I'd like to just bring you in. What, what would you say in terms of the atmosphere today? for the Jewish community. So obviously we have this uncomfortable history <laughs> and you even talked about in the 1990s coming out of communism, a certain revival of interest in some of the fascist leaders, et cetera, in terms of, and, and a sort of reluctance of kind of the government being dragged kicking and streaming is, into addressing issues around Holocaust, et cetera, and recognition. What, what would you say today, Raul, what's the atmosphere today in Romania in terms of the its Jewish community and attitudes towards the Jewish story in Romania? Thank you, Michael. It's a very good question. And as usual, the, the answer is not straightforward. Um, I think we can talk about two things when we talk about the attitude towards um, this history uh, and towards the Jewish communities in Romania. We can talk about the Romanian state and the Romanian authorities. And I think we can definitely talk about significant progress there. Um, in terms of Holocaust education, in terms of uh, drawing more attention to the tragedy of, of Romanian Jews, um, in terms of uh, legislation against anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, which was missing for a long, long time. The first piece of legislation against Holocaust denial was based, passed in 2002. So, you know, more than a decade after the end of socialism. Um, it badly needed updating and it was updated in 2015, but that legislation caused massive public debate in Romania. Um, the legislation is, exists, but very few people are uh, charged or, or, or prosecuted under it or convicted. The very first conviction for Holocaust denial was uh, in 2021, this year in February. Um, although the legislation is in place, like I said, from 2002. So you, the, there, is a, there is a discrepancy here between the state official attitude and persisting, I would say, anti-Semitism within Romanian society. Now, with regards to the latter, there are some shared features with Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this is something that you can experience in, in you know, present-day Poland, uh, in Hungary. Um, there have been instances of growing anti-Semitism uh, in, in both countries. I would say overall, even at the level of Romanian society, it's declining rather than increasing. So there is a more accepting attitude, uh, a more inclusive attitude towards Jewish communities. And many, I know many positive examples like the ones that, that Penina mentioned of non-Jews becoming involved with Jewish uh, culture and Jewish heritage and, and interested in, in, uh, in these. But there's still a lot of work to, that remains to be done. And if my answer, 
I, 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 I didn't get to say much and I'm not an expert on Jewish heritage, but I would really much from, from my side, I would like to re-emphasize what, what Gilbert was saying, was saying about Jewish heritage, not being just Jewish, but being Romanian European world heritage. Um, I think the problem with the erasure of Jewish communities and the action we need to take against the erasure of Jewish communities in Romanian history is to draw attention to the fact these were first and foremost from the point of view of the Romanian state, Romanian citizens. They might have been of a different religion, they might have professed a different ethnicity, but they were Romanians themselves. Uh, and this is something that I think the Romanian public and Romanian society needs to start to understand that um, this tragedy did not happen to outsiders, to foreigners, as they were called in the 19th century. It happened to a, a, a significant and intrinsic part of Romanian society, and one that gave a lot to Romania, contributed significantly to Romanian science, culture, the arts. Um, economy. Um, sorry? Economy. The economy, yes, of course. Um, sure. So this is, yeah, this is my, it, it's gotten really bad in December, because we didn't have a far right party in parliament since 2008, making us the exception in Eastern Europe. In December, that exception ended, and we have a far right party in parliament now. They are not openly anti Semitic, uh, but they do have uh, sympathies for the interwar fascist movement, which was. So it's hard to imagine they wouldn't be anti Semitic. Uh, and actually, last week, there was an intervention in parliament by one of the senators, which was openly anti Semitic. Um, so yeah, mixed. It's a, mix, it's, it's mixed a, picture. It's a mixed bag. Yes, yeah, so there's some there's improvements, and you see the recognition of Jews as citizens as part of the Romanian story is important, but there's also still problematic. Um, and I I pick up Raul, you know that point about um, the Jewish contribution, and I know for for those of us working in um, in the sphere of preserving Jewish heritage, you know one of the things we talk about is we don't just want it to be the story of the Holocaust. That we also want to talk about we also want to celebrate the jewish life that was and the vibrant communities that existed across romania that made their own distinct contribution to romanian society and i think that's that's as i say something that we're, we're all very conscious of so Jan, panina and gilbert do you want to just just briefly just comment in terms of how jews are feeling today in in, in romanian society i mean do, are they feeling comfortable are they um are they think, anxious? Are they... You know, uh, many Jews during the various decades, not necessarily only in Romania, generally, like if you are asking me, what am I? Am I Israeli? Am I Canadian? Am I Romanian? Am I a Jew? Okay. I think today's uh, Jews in Romania feel themselves, first they'll tell you, I'm Romanian. Then they're going to say, I believe in God, I'm Jewish, I do believe, I don't believe, but I'm Jewish too. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I think it is. And, that's a, and you're, you're saying that in, in a positive way, that they feel yes. identify with Romanian society. And yes, definitely. And they feel, you know, many of them have high positions again, but they are free to move around. It's not that they, you know, are bound to stay only in Romania. Many of them are coming here to Israel um, for lectures, for exchanges. The same thing is in Canada, I know. So um, okay. so they, feel, they feel that they represent the country that they were born. And Gilbert, is that is that your view? Is that would you? It's a, that it's a bit more. It's a bit more complex, to say the least. <laughs> so yes, uh, it might be so. Um, what I can remember, okay, during communism, there was an ambivalence. Okay, you, of course, ethnically. I'm 100%, I happen to be 100% Jewish, <laughs> others too. Culturally, I'm also Romanian, yes, and a European. As a Jewish uh, Romanian philosopher, Henri Wald once said, we all have a motherland and a fatherland. We have the ancestral fatherland Israel and the motherland, which is Romania. It's more complicated when you feel very much discriminated. Sometimes it happened at school, at work, for whatever reason it happened, okay? You feel more Jewish than ever. And afterwards, 
you know, when someone treats you very, very kindly, you feel very much part and parcel of the society. So it's much more complex. Nowadays, I would say Romania might be one of the safest places for Jews in Europe. By European standards, I underline this. <laughs> by European standards, it's one of the safest places. It's not um, China or Taiwan, nobody cares. But still, it is what it is. It's sometimes great, it's sometimes less good, but still, it's Europe. And um, now we're trying to make it very well known that, for example, okay, my, my grandpa, my paternal grandfather and my uh, maternal great grandfather fought in the First World War for Romania. We very much made Romania happen too, okay? So <laughs> Romania doesn't only belong to ethnic Romanians, it, only, it also belongs to ethnic Jews, ethnic Germans, ethnic Hungarians, ethnic Roma, whatever. It's still a universal uh, country to every ethnicity. It's still a concept that's very difficult to grasp for many, many Romanians were educated to think that Romania only belongs to ethnic Romanians. And I don't think it's a specific Romanian problem. It might be happening in Poland, for example, and in any other Eastern European countries. In France, everybody becomes French by citizenship, right? They, they become nationalized, okay? Or they, they're, okay, you have French nationality, whether you come from Africa, you come from Asia, you're born in Paris, you're still a French. In Romania, Poland, Hungary, the concept is a bit different. Well, so it might, yes. My yes. distinction, Junior, I think the technical term, Raul, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's ethno, ethno nationalism. Ethno nationalism, right? Yes, yeah. I think that's I mean, it. Yeah, that's there's, it. A, there's a distinction made in, in nationalism between civic nationalism, which would be the one based on citizenship, the French model, and ethnic nationalism, which looks at the ethnic roots. I think the distinction is overplayed, that the two coexist always. I mean, there's always a notion of, of citizenship. Your passport is not based on ethnicity, it's based on you right. know, the, the, your legal citizenship of a country. Uh, but there's always an element, I mean, also in France, I, I'm, I'm sure there are ethno-nationalists who think yes. some are more French than others. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> but here, the, the, it's, it's also that my emphasis has always been that, you know, that there's the, the way to look at, at Romania is, is to see it as multi-ethnic because it's, you know, I come from the region of Transylvania no one is ethnically <laughs> Romanian in Transylvania. Everyone can tra can trace roots to two, three, four ethnicities. If you look at your own sort of like you know background, uh, and that's what makes Romania and Central and Eastern Europe um, beautiful. That's what that's what gives value to the region. The fact it's it's its complexity, its its richness, is given by this uh, this um, ethnic composition, ethnic mix, cultural mix. And also of which the Jewish one is extremely important, has always been extremely important in Central and Eastern Europe. And, and then there's the overlay of a radical notion, which is the European Union, <laughs> which of, of, of nation states merging, merging a level of sovereignty and creating this huge, diverse Europe, the story of Europe. So which, and of course, Romania has bought into that. And one, one imagines, obviously, Romanians are traveling across Europe. I know in London, we have a big Romanian community here. And one assumes that's also having a certain impact within Romanian society as they look to embrace wider Europe. Obviously, there'll be those who will be nervous of it or who will resent it, whatever. But, but hopefully, it's a sincere engagement in the wider European story. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a great joke in Belgium, uh, speaking of ethnic nationalism and the European Union. That you know, the, the the Flemish and the Walloons decide to to separate, and you know, they, they make a split and they say, okay, Walloons to the left, um, uh, Flemish to the right, and the groups remains in the middle, uh, and it's the Jews, and they say, and we Belgians, where do where do we go? Um, <laughs> so, in, in a way, this notion of civic nationalism, this notion of belonging. To a, a shared space built on, on you know, as, as Belgium is, it's not built on ethnicity. It's it's 
it doesn't have there's no Belgian ethnicity. <laughs> there is you know Flemish or, or yes. mm -hmm. Walloon or French ethnicity. But this shared space of citizenship is all the more valuable for national minorities. Yes. Well, um, right. And look, and, and you know, I'm I'm picking up um, po a, a, a positive feeling in the way that Panina and Gilbert have spoken about the Jewish community today and challenging that our our topic heading of erasure. That, that I think we can say but it is premature or it is inaccurate. I'm conscious that we've gone past the six o'clock. So I, I wonder whether, do you, other uh, last few sentences, Gilbert, do you want to kick off? Is there anything? So we've been talking about the Jewish community, Jewish heritage, preserving that heritage, preserving the Jewish story. Um, preserving the Jewish story, yes. Uh, many people I hear pretty often nowadays would say, oh, I'm only Jewish today because of the Holocaust. Really, when I hear this, I mean, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's so depressing. Yes, I know. Are we really Jewish today because of the Holocaust? Just because of the Holocaust? The millennia, the thousands of years before the Holocaust don't really matter. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's very, very, very saddening. There were so many centuries a wealth of history, waves after waves of history, of events, of sages, of um, beautiful people and stories that shaped us in the marvels, passing marvels that we are today. And we're going to fade away, no turn, and others will come. And this is all there is we just relate our lives to the Holocaust or to the Inquisition, I don't think that would be fair. And it would be sad if it, would, if it were to be but so. You're saying, Gil, but, that there, but you're optimistic about the future. You're saying that there are people in Romania today who have a positive view about- There are many, who are many engaging. people engaging, what? especially Jewish people and non-Jewish people and see many youngsters that are more interested than I would ever dream of. Back when I was a teenager, a child in the 1980s, I would never dream of so many youngsters today being involved and being interested in our history, not being Jewish, the majority of them, but they're interested in Jewish history. I had Muslims from the Arab world coming to visit, interested in Jewish history, Iranians, Japanese people from Osaka and Tokyo, uh, New Zealanders, all sorts. I would never imagine such an interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, Indians, Pakistanis, yes, some of them for the first time in a Jewish place of worship. And I had to explain from scratch what was Judaism about, how Christianity came about from Judaism. Mm -hmm. And it went on to become Islam, centuries, seven centuries onward and so on. It's very interesting. The first great monotheistic religion that morphed later on through the influence of the Roman Empire to Christianity and later on to Islam and so on. And what, and what draws them in is, is the physical space of the choral synagogue. That there's, there, there are places that people can visit that you can walk inside Jewish space and have an encounter with the Jewish story. So it's very important that these places survive so that people can continue to engage and understand and appreciate. So Penina, what would you say? as a kind of summary comment. Wow, we talked so much about it. Um, really, to summarize it, I think that uh, we've done a great job until now. And I think that we, I think what's missing is the passing of the torch or if we want to say in general, transmitting. I think uh, we need more education. And by the way, this came up at another panel that we had uh, via the AEPJ, you know, the organization. Yes. Um, back to the people who are managing, non-Jews who are managing Jewish sites, yes. I think that in order to perpetuate in the future, uh, the continuation, we need to provide much better uh, learning, teaching, education of it. Yes. Um, I think this is the crucial place because they are eager, these people that are 
uh, working on the Jewish heritage site. Um, but um, too much of theory goes there. Now, of course, um, you know, I have in my little heart a very special place for Siget or for any other location in Romania, but um, we need to try and uh, pass this somehow because when tourists are coming, I'm sure when Gilbert speaks, it's different than if we would have had somebody else that speaks like in a book, like theory. So uh, I don't know how to uh, label it, maybe some spirituality we need to add. Something has to, um, yeah, something has to be transmitted, yeah. continued That's in a right. way. Yeah, better, you know, better yeah. interpretation, maybe. Better interpretation. Right. And the other thing is, it's not just uh, the building was built and et cetera, et cetera. It's extremely important to add stories, stories about personalities who walked in this synagogue, who, like we know about Rabbi Rosen and so on. These are the kinds of things that I find that it's a bit missing. Yeah. A bit more missing. And, I, and, and, and I, just want, yeah. I just wanted to stress one thing that Raul said, but Raul spoke so fast that I want to make sure whoever listens to um, this presentation uh, takes it in consideration. And what I want to say is that Romania as a country accepted that there was a Holocaust in Romania and took responsibility that there was a Holocaust in Romania only in the year 2002, following the report of the late Elie Wiesel. And the only reason why they accepted was because there is um, in the applications to become an EU member, there is a section where the country has to admit, or maybe it wasn't, you know? So come to think about, we are in the year 2021, so it's barely 20 years. Yeah, so, um, on one hand, we've advanced tremendously on the subject in general, but on the other hand, there is still a lot of work. Yeah. And one of the things is that the schools in high schools must learn the period. And although it's in the curriculum, not every school is uh, going through it. That's right. And what, and what Jewish Heritage can provide is, is an ex experiential education that you can come in again to Jewish space. And also what you're saying, Panina, about personal stories, it humanizes. Exactly. That's right, that you can empathize with individual stories with children who were your age and you, you know, there's photographs and it, it makes it real. And um, so I, I'm completely with you in that notion. Raul, thank you. Last a few last um, sentences before we wind up. Anything, any final words? Well, it's it's it's, it's not great to, to leave you to the Holocaust historian to say some final words. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, but I, I very much uh, agree with, with what, what Penina said. I also believe that the future lies with education. We need more education uh, and we need to start, I mean, in, in terms of R Romania needs to start looking at the tragedy of the Holocaust as part of Romanian history, not part of Jewish history, but as an important as moment in Romanian history. And of course, no one wants to, to be a, a, a perpetrator. No one wants to, to be reminded of the fact that war crimes were committed by Romanians. Yeah, yeah. Every state has tried to, to avoid this kind of responsibility. But now that the state has accepted it, we need to make it an integral part of education. Yeah. Um, and we need to we, we need Romanians to know that this happened. Yeah. Um, and like Perina said, it's, it's important that this becomes mainstreamed in high schools. I'm part of a project um, that takes place in May, where um, university staff working on sensitive topics in Central and Eastern Europe are teaching high school teachers about how to teach on those topics, how to, how to manage resistance, how to manage uh, lacks of knowledge of the students. Because again, it's not just the, it's not the only topic. There are many topics about which 
States have preferred to be quiet and silent. Mm -hmm. And we need to speak about these topics, even if they are sensitive, and if, even if they are problematic, because the involvement of non-Jews is extremely important if this story is to, be, to, to remain an optimistic one and a, and a positive one. Um, we need that involvement, and that involvement can be provided through education um, that, that makes it integral to Romania, like I said, not, not a story of others being persecuted, but a story of, of something that happened in this country and to members of its own community, if we think of it in, in sort of like civic citizenship terms. Well, one, you're absolutely right, Ron. If you think of what's education about, I mean, you know, we're trying to build better societies and to build better societies, we also have to confront the past and understand the past so that we can draw lessons and build a better future. And I think, Raul, a couple of things have been that issue of competing narratives. You know, how do you address competing narratives with different perspectives? And also, I, I was listening to an event with Euroclio, you know, the teaching of history across Europe. And one of the things that was said is that we, we have to be comfortable addressing an uncomfortable past. You know, so, I, so I'm, I'm completely with you in that. What can I say? It's been absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've learned a hell of a lot about Romania, about the Jewish community in Romania. So thank you so much for that. And I'm now going to hand over to David. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, Michael, as a moderator, of course, you've been a, a little reticent to mention the work that you do yourself with the Foundation for Jewish Heritage. So let me please plug the Foundation for Jewish Heritage. You can find details of it um, on our Facebook page because, of course, the Foundation have been a key participant in this event today. Um, one of the, their featured projects is, in fact, the synagogue, the Citadel Synagogue in Timisoara. And that, I believe, is... is um, undergoing restoration at the moment and, and indeed amongst your audience today is Lucia Apostol who has been one of the, the leading advocates of that project so can I just uh, congratulate Lucia on the work that she is doing in Timisoara. Um, we are running over time, we're running over time because it has been such a fascinating discussion and I would love it to go on longer. Um, I, I, I hope that when I'm back in Bucharest, Gilbert, I'll have the chance to see you again and to spend some time in the in the Choral Synagogue. And I hope also, Panina, that I'll have the chance to, to visit Sigit and to see the Elie Wiesel Museum and also the, the fabulous work that you're doing there. Thank you, Raoul, for your contribution today. And I think the project that you mentioned at the end, that might be perhaps the one that's being run by the Raichu Foundation. I know that there, uh, I work very closely with, with Nikolai Raichu and the family. I think they do some, some fabulous work uh, so it's great to see that you're also involved in that. Uh, it remains now only for me to thank our co-hosts, the Romanian Cultural Institute in London and Magda Stroy, for, uh, the acting director there, for her fantastic support for these three events. The videos of the two previous events are already up on our YouTube channel, and the video from this event will appear there maybe later today or tomorrow morning, depending on how motivated I am to get it up there. But it's certainly going to be worth re-watching again. So let me just, again, thank you to all of our panelists um, and to the audience. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do come back for more at a future date. Goodbye. Thank you Bye. very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Great seeing everybody.